Thanks everyone for your time and your patience. Uh, welcome to the St. Vincent's open evening for the 2024 internship recruitment period. Uh, my name is uh, Brendan Morrissey. I'm the supervisor of intern training for St. Vincent's and I'll be uh, facilitating a, a bit of tonight's session. Um, I'm joined this evening by Aaron Sloan, one of our medical education officers. Um, also in line with us, we have a couple of other members from the medical education team, uh, Linda Healy, our medical education coordinator, uh, and Jenny Noonan, um, our director of pre-vocational supervision. Uh, we're lucky to also have our general manager for medical workforce, uh, Catherine Carberry, and um, a number of representatives from our people services, uh, Leah Lawler and uh, Sarah Rotoli. So thanks to all of the team for joining us this evening. Um, I'd like to start the session with an acknowledgement of country. I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land in which I stand uh, this evening, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. I'd like to pay my respects to their elders, both past and present. I'd like to extend my respect to any Indigenous people who are joining us on the meeting this evening. Um, we'd like to have a little bit of a presentation about uh, internship at St. Vincent's. Um, so I'd like to introduce our Chief Pedagogue Officer, Dr. Anthony Tobin, um, to offer a little bit of an introduction to the evening. And Thanks, Brendan. I'm not sure, is my camera not working? If I can, right, it might be better without pictures. Um, all right. We can see you, we can see you. Okay, all right, bad luck. Um, so my name's Anthony Tobin. Uh, I'm the Chief Medical Officer here at St. Vincent's, uh, and I'd like to uh, welcome you all to this information evening and hope that you get the information and the answers uh, you're seeking so that you can make this uh, next big choice in uh, your career. Uh, I think I'm pretty well qualified to talk about St Vincent's, uh, at least uh, from a historical point of view. I was a medical student here back in the uh, 1980s, probably before a lot of you were born, well, most of you probably. Um, and I did my intern year here, as well as my basic physician training uh, and also my ICU training. Uh, and I've been a full-time consultant here since 2003. I've also worked at a lot of hospitals around Melbourne, um, most of the major metros, um, uh, and as a, either a JMS or as a consultant. And I've also worked overseas. So I've experienced a few different places and ways of working. But there's something about St V's that is special, and um, I suppose that's what I'm here to talk to you about tonight is to you know, why perhaps you should think about uh, coming to work with us. Uh, and, and I think it boils down to our ethos and our culture. Uh, there's a certain something about St. V's that uh, people, certain people keep coming back to uh, and keep wanting to come back to us and think of St. Vincent's as their, their home and uh, want to come back here again uh, after the training uh, because it is a great place to work. And, and it's hard to define what that is. And I was talking to the uh, the CEO about it, and it was he was asked. This is our new CEO, our group CEO, and he was asking, "What is it about St Vincent's that uh, that makes it special?" And it's very hard to define. And you know, basically, in the end, we just decided it was the vibe. Um, it's hard to to you know to pin it down, but that vibe is probably something different to every to all of us. Um, and one of the things that I like about it is that we are relatively small, people are friendly, and, and we don't have the same hierarchical structure or you know formality in terms of senior people dealing with junior people. You know we get on well with people across disciplines. Uh, we know the names of the cleaners. You know we we have a very flat uh, organisation. Um, for some people, it might be that we're faith we're faith based, uh, we've got a faith based culture, and that gives us a focus on some of the vulnerable groups in our community, like the homeless, prisoners, uninsured uh, patients, people who aren't Medicare insured, like uh, refugees, uh, as well as our First Nations uh, patients. And for many people, that's a core part of the business that uh, attracts them to St Vincent's, because I think we do it a little bit differently here. For some, it's the relationships they build. And as I said, in a smaller hospital, um, Especially, perhaps it's easier to uh, to build relationships and lasting relationships and lasting friendships. And I think that the flat hierarchy also makes it easy for us to build relationships across disciplines. Uh, and that because we have that respect for people, you know, whether they're nurses, physios, 
cleaners, whoever they are, we, we respect each other for, for what we do and for the skills that we bring to the management of patients. Um, and, and for others, it's the fact that, you know, we do have a great culture of teaching and training in this hospital and we have excellent results for medicine and surgery, but we also provide uh, training that, you know, forms the, uh, the background for people who want to move on to other careers, whether that's pathology or general practice or paediatrics. So, you know, we, we are a teaching hospital. We take teaching and training very seriously, and it's one of our key strengths. So whatever it is, whatever the vibe that, you know, takes your fancy, uh, I think, you know, we are a great place to work. Uh, and so I just encourage you to uh, listen to the presentations that are coming tonight. Uh, and take the opportunity to talk to some of the doctors who, who work here uh, later on in the evening to hear why they uh, like working here and to, to find out what the vibe is for them. Uh, and I hope that uh, some or many of you uh, choose to work with us. So welcome and I uh, hope you enjoy the evening. Thanks so much, Anthony. Thanks for your time. Um, I'd like to offer a little bit of an outline of the next bits of the presentation. I'm going to speak for a little bit on what St. Vincent's has to offer for our internship program. Um, I'm then going to throw to our general manager of workforce for a little bit brief introduction of, of uh, workforce's role. Then we'll hear from our people services about the um, recruitment process and, and some of the uh, nuances around that. Following on from that, we'll have a Q&A session with some of our current interns so you get to hear about what the year has been like so far, some of the highs and lows, and what we have to offer here at St. Vincent's for them. Following on from all of those components, we're hoping to leave a hefty little bit of time uh, at the end of today's session uh, for a question and answer session with yourselves. And so the uh, chat function is open uh, for people to throw in questions along the way. Hopefully we'll answer some of the bigger ticket items uh, through the presentations you're about to hear. But if not, we'll be able to feel them through the chat. So internship at St. Vincent's. There are five components to this that I'd like to talk to. You. Um, one is the interesting rotations that we offer and the opportunity to build your career with us. Two is that we endeavor to make a safe and well-supervised um, experience and workplace for you. Three is the priority we place on our educational program and educational opportunities through St. Vincent's. Four is the support, both clinical and non-clinical, that we can offer throughout the year. And five is the opportunities that we offer our interns and, and those in further rotations uh, to shape and build our program to improve it into the future. So to start off with point number one, the rotations that we offer at St. Vincent's. We offer a cavalcade of rotations within our hospital and external to it across the year. Um, some, of the, some of the bigger ticket uh, rotations that draw attention from uh, within the hospital, we have anaesthetics and radiology, radiology rotations that are, are uh, highly regarded. Our cardiothoracics and uh, renal rotations also very highly regarded um, uh, amongst the intern and HMO cohort. We're also very proud of some of our newer rotations in the hospital. Our psychiatry rotations in the Department of Addiction Medicine and Acute and Patient Services have received unanimously positive feedback um, since we've uh, created them. For the external rotations, we offer a number of external rotations. I suppose the most popular of which is the Royal Children's Hospital rotation. We're the only uh, hospital in the state that offers a rotation to the Royal Children's Hospital. Um, that's a relationship that we're very proud of and, and that people have found great utility from in rotation there. We also offer rotations through general medicine, surgery um, and psychiatry across Warrnambool, Hamilton and Swan Hill District Hospital. Um, and we have a relatively new rotation in general practice through Swan Hill Hospital that again has received some very positive feedback for uh, anyone who's interested in general practice as a, as a career pathway. Talking to point two, endeavouring that we make a safe and well-supervised program for you across these rotations. Well, I suppose that begins with our orientation program. So here at St. Vincent's, we have a three-day orientation program to the hospital. That's a blended um, 
group of sessions that encompass some uh, lectures and didactic uh, sessions from our chief medical officer, amongst others, to make sure you feel safe and welcome to our hospital. We also offer some skills sessions to kind of reorientate you to some of the more common procedures they may be performing during intern year. That would be data puncture, IV cannulation, IDC insertion, etc. There's also a shadow shift, so you get to um, talk to and uh, work alongside the intern who will be leaving the post that you'll be taking over from um, in the in the coming term. And people have repeatedly given feedback on how that's the most useful in preparing um, our incoming interns to the role they're going to take on. Outside of that general orientation, there's also the unit specific orientation. Um, the exact makeup of, of each of those unit orientations varies from unit to unit, depending on, on the workload and what is involved in the role. I suppose my background is in emergency medicine, so to speak, to the emergency department's orientation process. We have a rover document that is sent out uh, prior to your commencement with us. We also have a two hour in person orientation program uh, by our term supervisor, Dr. Joel Wilson. And we have a number of um, educational modules that we have online for our interns so they can um, reorientate themselves or, or, or educate themselves on some of the more common presentations we see through the emergency department. Outside of that orientation process, we have another, a number of other programs to ensure that there's a safe and well supervised uh, year for all of our incoming interns. Part of that is having an open dialogue with you about how the year is going, how each rotation is going and what we can do to improve it. And so as part of our education program across the year, we have regular meetups and discussions um, from all of our interns regarding how the term went, what went well, what we can build on and improve. We take those um, conversations and we work with our units or our uh, chief medical officer or whoever needs to be involved to ensure that we're continually reviewing and improving the rotations um, to ensure that the safest, best supervised rotations for you. Uh, to speak to our, the, the third thing I wanted to talk about, our education program. Well, this comes in a number of facets. There's our formal education program, uh, our informal education program, and the opportunity for various training streams. If I can talk to our uh, current interns and what they're experiencing in their formal education program, well, across the year we have uh, one hour of protected teaching time every Tuesday. So from Tuesday 12.30 to 1.30 or in lunchtime, we have an education program here, mostly based in our um, education learning center, um, developed around the curriculum for interneers. So there are specific sessions on common uh, problems across interneers, such as perioperative fluid management, uh, management of behaviorally disturbed patients, etc. There's also a couple of sessions that are perhaps more bespoke to the patient cohort and the um, priorities that we place in, in St. Vincent's. Um, so there's, we are the only hospital that has a, a prison ward or correctional health ward um, in the hospital. And so there's a correctional health uh, session given on, on uh, considerations around uh, patient interactions within, within correctional health. There's also sessions on uh, Indigenous health and how, uh, how to develop and, and ensure a culturally safe environment for our Indigenous patients. We see some, some of the highest percentages of um, Indigenous patient presentations across all of the metro hospitals in Melbourne. Um, outside of those educational sessions within the teaching program, we also try to consider your educational needs and your development across the year and beyond. And so at the start of the uh, educational calendar, we have some useful sessions on how to get the most out of each year and some of the more common pagers or conversations you'll need to have uh, in referrals and kind of handover or, or on referral of patients um, at the start of the year. Towards the middle of the year, we want your one we run sessions on the uh, recruitment process about what to expect from it and how best to approach it. And towards the end of the year, we have sessions on reflections on, on some of the interesting cases you may have uh, experienced across the year, but also how best to prepare yourself for HMO year and the challenges that may bring. 
Um, looking at HMR year, we, we offer um, some information around the different training streams and how to build on your education, build on your training, about what rotations we offer within HMO2 year and uh, how best to approach them. I know that seems like a world away now, but um, I promise they're useful at the time. Um, speaking to the fourth point I wish to, wish to talk to about providing support. We pride ourselves on being a, a supportive a hospital and, and unit as we possibly can for our interns. Um, that comes under a, 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 a whole host of, of programs and processes. Uh, to speak to some of them are each rotation, you will have clinical supervisors and that will be the registrars and fellows that you're working with on a day-to-day -day basis. But we also have term supervisors within each unit. That will be consultants nominated within each unit to ensure that you have um, an orientation to the unit, that you have mid-term feedback, and that you're able to meet with them for end-of-term feedback as well to track your progress across each rotation. These term supervisors are um, a group of individuals that we hold in high regard as being uh, able to provide educational and support opportunities to you. And the Mental Health Education Unit, for which I work in, um, we have constant um, uh, conversation and open dialogue to ensure that any issues that arise or any support that is required, there's continuity of care for you as interns across the intern year. Um, so moving on from one rotation to the next, we provide sort of kind of some of that cohesion um, to make sure that your support is ongoing across the year. Other supports that we offer are mentorship programs. So we have kind of a near peer mentorship program where we get, we get some information from you at the start of the year um, as to what your interests are, where your, where your future career path may lie, and try to link you with, with a near peer HMO two or three and in the year above you. Uh, allows you a bit of an opportunity to, to link in with someone to have a, a familiar voice across the year, someone who's perhaps walked in your shoes um, in the internship and is able to provide you with advice and support that is perhaps more relevant than me and my, my ancient history of, of internship. Um, other support structures that we have in place in St. Vincent's is our STAR uh, support program. We're aware that internship can be challenging. Um, in a number of ways. One of those, I suppose, is the clinical challenges that are, are faced. Um, a acutely deteriorating or unexpectedly deteriorating patient of the ward can be a stress for not just an individual, but for an entire team. Our STAR program has been developed to allow peer support in those situations, so to allow kind of a hot debrief um, with a trained member of staff that can meet you at your level and just unpack what has occurred in a challenging clinical environment. They're not trained counsellors, um, they're not, they're, their role isn't to provide that, but we do have access to more formal uh, counselling support through our Access EAP program. That's an entirely confidential and entirely free service that allows you access to counselling following on from such an event or for whatever um, personal, personal counselling uh, requirements you may need. So I'm always surprised going onto the Access EAP website and kind of trying to explore what they can offer, the number of avenues of support um, that are available to our staff. Like I say, entirely free and entirely confidential. That kind of brings out the main educational project, or sorry, support uh, projects and programs that we have outside of ourselves. I want to talk a little bit about the, the medical education team. So there's myself as a supervisor of intern training, but I'm only a very small part of this program. We have our medical education officers, both Erin and um, Elise, and our educational uh, medical education coordinator, Belinda. Rounding out the team, we have uh, Dr. Jimmy Newnham as our uh, director of pre vocational supervision. Within this team, we are probably your most common point of contact across the year. So we don't expect you to be able to remember all of this stuff, but know where to find all of it uh, across the intern year. If you don't know when you have a question, we're your most likely point of contact. We're more than happy to be contacted about whatever it is you need. Um, and if we don't know the answer, we'll be able to um, find out who does and point you in the right direction. So we'll be your, your, your point of contact across the year. Hopefully that gives you a little bit of insight into the sports we try to offer across the intern year. The final thing I wanted to talk about is opportunities to be involved in the hospital. 
we want to work with people who want to work with us and we highly value um, staff retention, which is why we want to be make sure that you have the opportunity to have a voice in what is happening in the hospital and a voice in how to shape improvement within the hospital. That happens kind of structurally in a couple of different ways. We have a JMS reference group um, and a JMS education committee that meets regularly to discuss issues important within the educational sphere or in the hospital more broadly and shapes the programs in those areas. They speak directly to our, um, our programs in those areas and to our JMAC, our Junior Medical Advisory Committee. So it has a voice to our Chief Medical Officer and our Executive to ensure that uh, issues and challenges and problems that are important to you are raised and addressed in a timely manner across the hospital. Other, other opportunities to be involved in the hospital are kind of in our more uh, subsection um, parts of our JMS groups. So the RMO Society, our preset committee, um, our, um, there's a number of other um, JMS groups that we encourage you to be involved with, encourage you to build programs in our surgical training or uh, physician training programs. It allows you to kind of network and, and, and build those programs. So hopefully that, that gives you a bit of a picture of Interte in St. Vincent's. Um, like I said, I was only uh, skimming across some of the things we have to offer. I'm sure there are questions around some of those, the rotations, etc. Like I said, there'll be an opportunity to, uh, to ask questions about any of these or dig deeper into any of the points I've raised um, up to this point. But in the interest of time, I'd like to move on and hear a little bit about uh, from our uh, other uh, members of the team online tonight. I'm going to stop sharing my screen for a moment. I'm going to um, see if Catherine Carberry, our general manager of um, our medical workforce unit, is online, and would like to say a few words around your role in our internship program. Thanks, Brendan. Uh, hello, everyone, and thank you for for joining us. And after uh, we've got through these little bits here, I really encourage you to answer to offer any questions that you have, and hopefully we can answer those for you. I just want to tell you a little bit just about medical workforce and how we sort of fit into to your uh, term as an intern here. The medical workforce team is. Uh, myself as um, well, general manager or director of operations, depending on what hat I'm wearing on the day. And we also have a clinical director who's Dr. Neil Cunningham, and then a team of clinical advisors and administration teams who work really closely with each one of the clinical units to ensure we've got rosters that support not only safe clinical care and support and cover from medical staff, but also your training requirements and uh, EBA compatible as well. Um, where our clinical advisors, probably about half of our team have uh, quite a strong clinical background. Uh, so we're very sort of have a really personal and well-traveled understanding of the clinical world and the priorities. And we hope that that uh, aims to to ensure that your experience here as an intern is is really an enjoyable one and a rewarding one um, as we try and make that that year as an intern here is as beneficial as possible. Um, probably medical workforce really come into play um, once you're successful in becoming a St Vincent's intern. Um, and we'll contact you then and ask you to complete a, a preference survey. And this is where we ask you just to rank where you would like to go. So we'll give you all the preferences you can choose from. We ask you to rank them. And then we work with um, the supervising team, the education team, and, and work an allocation out for what your, your year is going to look like. Um, I think it's really important to mention that uh, you might not get your first preference, but that's okay uh, because every single rotation that we have is beneficial to you. You will get, it's the opportunity to learn and to learn new skills that will benefit you, not only in your next rotation, but as you progress into a HMO and further down your career. So make the most of every opportunity that you have in the rotations that you have. Really important to make the most of that. 
And I think as Brendan said, there's a couple of rotations which are highly popular. So anaesthetics and radiology, just to name a couple. And we only have a few rotations of those. So um, they are highly competitive and we, we do appreciate and understand that. Probably the other thing just to mention, and it's probably one of our most important roles and very important to you is that we are the people who ensure that you get paid. Um, so really important role. Um, so that's making sure that, you know, your rosters are, are inputted into our payroll system appropriately and all your leave is paid appropriately. And most, I think the other thing is just any overtime that you might do, we, we make sure that that's paid and it's paid within a, um, an EBA compliant time. Uh, obviously, we don't want you to do shed loads of overtime, but if you do do it, then certainly we'll make sure you pay for it. Um, and I think that's kind of overarching what medical workforce is about. We work closely with the education team and all the supervisors in the clinical world and HR, who you're going to hear from in a minute. Um, but overarching is to make sure that you have a really great time as an intern here. Thank you. Hi, Stephen. Thank you. Like I say, there'll be an opportunity to ask questions um, and we'll be able to, um, anything we can't answer this evening, we're more than happy to take, up, take on and get back to you guys the email um, following on from this evening's talk. Um, I'd like to go to next our uh, People Services uh, group. Uh, we're lucky to be joined by Anita Lawler, our recruitment manager for People Services, and Sarah Ratoli, one of our recruitment advisors. Um, Leah and uh, Sarah, hello. Um, I'm just going to share screen again. I, there a couple of slides here. Great, thank you. So I'm just going to run you through some tips and tricks on preparing for your interview and for your application. Uh, so first, to prepare your technology well before you're scheduled to record. So make sure you download any required apps or platforms and create any accounts that you may need to. And PMCV do have further details on this part as it's part of the registration process. Uh, secondly, if you are able to check your Wi-Fi strength, your computer audio and that your webcam, they're all working. Generally, when using a platform, you do have the opportunity to do this beforehand, but it's always good to double check and triple check that everything's working. Next, preparing your environment. If you can, set yourself up in a quiet, well-lit area with a neutral background. Have a look in your background, make sure there's nothing inappropriate in view because that's not always the best um, way to go forward with your interview. Next, I'd say have whatever notes you may need next to you. A notepad, a pen, a copy of your CV, a cover letter in case you need to refer to it, and you'll have that opportunity to write anything down that you may need to as well. Feel free to have a glass or a bottle of water next to you. If you do get nervous, it's always helpful to have a sip of water to clear that dry throat. Uh, next, dress professionally. Uh, this is a really important point that we can't stress this enough. I'd say dress as if you were to come in for a face-to-face -face interview. And be early and be prepared. If you do have a specific time where you do need to record, make sure that you're ready to go 10 to 15 minutes beforehand. So this will ensure that you can react to any technical technical issues that you may have. And if something does go wrong, we can work through it and get you going in time. Finally, practice makes perfect. I'd say pre-record yourself on your phone or on your laptop and listen back to it. And that way you can check your tone, check your speed. And because when we are nervous, we do tend to speak quite quickly. So you'll be able to fix those errors should you need to. And looking at the webcam, so in most instances, when you look at the webcam, you'll make eye to eye contact to the person who's viewing your video. And so your body language is also important. So think about your posture as well when you're being recorded. You can hop to the next slide when you're ready, guys. Thank you. Okay, so St. Vincent's Hospital Melbourne uses a human resource management system called Workday. So to apply to St. Vincent's, you need to search up the medical intern on our careers page, or you can also use an external job site such as Seek to apply. So St. Vincent's aligns with the PMCV dates. So applications close on the 8th of June, which is a Thursday. And unfortunately, late applications are not accepted. If you do run into any issues with applying, you can contact me or my admin. So that's the JMS recruitment at svha.org.au email address, and we'll ensure that we can get you through any issues that you may that you may have. 
Um, so please submit your cover letter, CV, and any other documents as one entire document, please. So this just kind of helps us read through everyone's application. And when you are ready to submit, click apply and follow all the prompts. And if you mismatch anything or you're unable to re-log in or resubmit anything, feel free to send anything to that email address, the JMS recruitment email, and we can do this for you and get you through everything. And finally, something that's really important is keeping your CV concise. Uh, we recommend no longer no longer than five to six pages, but don't forget to not sell yourself short. And remember to use the PMCV template that's available to download from the PMCV website. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks, Sarah. Um, let me just, like a dinosaur, figure out how to share. I say if anyone has any questions for our people services or medical workforce team, we'll have questions at the end. Um, I see they're already beginning to flow through. Um, our next section, I want to do, you to hear from some of our current interns to get um, a better real life experience of what internship is like with us at St. Vincent's. So we take a leap of faith and hopefully we're joined down the line by um, a few of our current interns. Uh, Cassie and Vanessa, are you there? Yes. <laughs> Hello. Right. Okay. Hello. Um, and, Hello. Hey. Um, checking in. Aiden, are you there as well? Yes, I am. Good day. Well, lovely. Great to hear from you. And I think Jen um, is hopefully going to join us, but maybe running a little bit late. Um, the real life of being an intern. Um, I might start by just introducing, uh, getting you guys to introduce yourselves to the group. Um, we'll go around and find a little bit about uh, your background and what rotations you were doing across the year, so people just have, uh, can kind of uh, have that in mind uh, when we're chatting. Um, so Aidan, you're uh, first on my screen. I'll give you a little bit of instruction, your background, interests and rotations for this year. Sounds good. Thank you, Brendan, and uh, thanks to, to all of the team uh, for having us along tonight. Uh, so I'm Aidan, I'm an intern at St V's. Uh, in terms of um, being kind of St, St V's born and bred, I'm just about as good as you get. I've been at St V's my entire med school uh, career, actually worked at St V's prior to that as well. So um, I have a fair bit of experience at the hospital and I guess the fact that I've, I've stayed here is a pretty good testament to my experience. Um, I have done my first rotation in the Department of Surgery, so that's covering breast and endocrine surgery. Uh, now I have moved on to general medicine, and then my next three rotations are emergency, uh, then urology, and finally doing an external rotation at Hamilton, uh, doing gen surge at the end of the year. Um, I do, as you can uh, probably tell by those rotations, have a, an interest in surgery. Um, Brendan was discussing uh, lots of the societies that you can get involved in and I am involved with the preset society, um, which I can chat a little bit, bit about, but basically uh, brings people in with a surgical interest and we have week weekly education sessions, GSSE shoots, networking, etc. Uh, and already that's been fantastic for me. Um, again, I can expand a little bit about why I love St V's, but I think a lot of it is on the same theme as uh, what you heard from earlier from Anthony Tobin. Uh, the the community feel and, and the vibe of the place is fantastic. And uh, yeah, I, I really love it. Uh, everyone's extremely friendly. And um, I really kind of echo uh, what was mentioned about the, the, the flat hierarchy and, you know, knowing everyone's name from, from the cleaner to the head of surgery. That's definitely been my, my experience. So uh, I've absolutely loved it. Um, yeah, I'm happy to answer any questions uh, after the other two introduce themselves on, on specifics that you have. Thanks so much, Aidan. Thank you. Um, just so people know the room, um, I flick to the next um, person I can see, Vanessa. Um, do you want to hello? Um, Hi. To unmute and tell me a little bit about yourself, your background, your rotations for this year. Yeah. So uh, my name's Vanessa. Um, I am not born and bred CVs, but I still love it anyway. Um, so I studied at Deakin and did two years in Geelong and then my clinical years in Warrnambool and came from there. Um, 
this year I've so far done uh, the neurostroke rotation and now I'm on Gen Med. Um, coming up, I've got ED, Werribee Surge, and then um, Department of Surgery, Breast and Endo, like Aiden. Um, so far, my experience has been pretty wonderful. I think coming from uh, quite a small hospital to even though St. Vince is comparatively still smaller and like more community feel, but quite large to me, um, it's been actually really welcoming and really lovely. Um, everyone's been super, super friendly and nice and um, made lots of really good um, friends so far, so that's been really good. Uh, I think um, in terms of the work, uh, everyone's been quite supportive as well in terms of um, like the uh, amount, the workload and, and responding to feedback and um, all of those kind of things. So, um, yeah, I, I don't know, that's that's basically all I've got. And, oh, and my interest, sorry, I'll just say what my interests are. Um, I'm actually interested in obstetrics and gynecology, which is um, not something that St. Peter's does, but um, uh, I... Um, yeah, so uh, that's what my interests are, and I'm just kind of looking into developing my skills first and then go from there. Thanks. Happy to answer the question. Thank you. Um, and right back, Cassie. Um, same question yeah. to you. So a little bit about yourself and a bit about the rotation so far, or particularly yep. this year. <laughs> Sounds good. Um, so hi, everyone. My name is Cassie. Um, I guess. This is actually probably a perfect hybrid between Aiden and um, Vanessa in that I'm sort of a St. B's born and bred, but also sort of not. Um, I started med school and was in a rural clinical school um, for my first year of clinical training. And then for the last um, year or so of med school, came across to St. B's. Um, and I think leading into choosing where I wanted to intern, <clears throat> um, that experience across a few different health services really played into that because what stood out to me about St V's was it's this city-based hospital that has a lot of the metropolitan um, services that you that I was particularly interested in, but the community feel that everyone's talked about so far that was similar to a regional hospital um, was something that I really, really liked. Um, and the fact that you can um, talk to lots of different people in either different specialties or um, different sort of fields in general in the health industry um, is really, really nice. Um, in terms of what I've done so far, I started on a surgical rotation in neurology um, and I'm currently doing my ED term. Um, and after that, I'm doing psych, then gen med and finishing up a paediatric rotation at the children's. Um, in terms of my interests, I was one of those students in med school that pretty much liked every rotation that I um, did, which made it a bit confusing when I sort of started to think about my future career pathways. And I wouldn't say I'm set in stone in anything yet, but I'm particularly interested in critical care. And I think that's where um, the next steps will probably um, go for me. But um, yeah, it's a good sign that I'm enjoying my ED rotation so far. So yeah, that's pretty much it. Probably because the best rotation I presume. Um, <laughs> Very biased, I'm <laughs> um, I want to talk to you guys about orientation at St. Vincent's, uh, the general orientation and the unit orientation that you would have experienced so far. Um, I might go in reverse now, start again with Cassie and keep on you. Um, so, what was your experience of, of um, general orientation to the hospital, um, having some knowledge of? of um, and your unit-based orientation following from that? Yeah, um, so overall orientation, I guess for a bit of structure um, so that everyone's aware is that basically the week before you sort of start um, life on the wards, um, you have a three-day orientation with the whole intern cohort at St. V's. Um, and I loved it. it, was my overall experience. It was really great to sort of meet everyone that you're gonna be working with and everyone's obviously quite excited, a little bit nervous and apprehensive about starting. Um, but it's a great place to sort of meet everyone that you're going to be working with to start with. You get to meet the medical education team, um, some of who are on the, online tonight. Um, and that sort of puts you in a really comfortable, familiar space um, and people that you'll immediately be able to go to for help over um, your coming weeks of your opening rotation for the rest of the year. Um, you go through a lot of sort of orientation sort of lectures about how the general hospital works, um, how to sort of order scans or the little 
um, intricate details that you sort of need to start to um, learn on your introduction to the hospital, I suppose. Um, I think the highlight of the orientation for me, and I think this would be similar for um, a lot of other interns, was that you get to do a cover shift um, or a shift with uh, the outgoing intern of the rotation that you're about to start. So for me, that was a day during urology with the um, intern on their final day. And that was probably the best sort of way to integrate yourself into the team, get to know everyone and uh, kind of get your head around things a little bit. Um, so I really liked that and that was really valuable. I'm not sure if you feel the same. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I think um, definitely the orientation um, pre-commencing work was great and doing that shadow shift is really, really helpful. So I guess for Aiden and Cassie who have previously been at St. Lee's prior to doing their internship, uh, maybe a little bit familiar with the systems, for me, as someone coming completely externally, it definitely um, was a trial by fire. Um, but um, it, it, I, I think like the thing that makes it good is that even though you have that set orientation and then your unit orientation, like everyone is still always really supportive and helping you learn and like all of the staff in hospital giving you a continuous orientation, I guess, as you progress through your rotations, which is really nice. Um, uh, I think um, like Cassie basically has said, most of the things that I um, think as well in terms of it's really nice to meet everybody and to um, just develop those connections at the start because once you start working it's really hard to kind of catch up with different interns and that but then once you like at least meet someone's see someone's face at least when you're looking at each other in the hallway in the middle of the code or something you're like you know um so that was really lovely um but yeah so um I guess yeah the overall orientation experience was pretty positive um but definitely you can't learn everything in three days and I think that's to be expected but you're well supported for the entirety of your rotations as well so that's um something that's really positive thanks Vanessa and I, I do think that's key and like something we try to um uh, really emphasize especially coming through the emergency department that orientation isn't a event it's a process and the first few weeks with us is finding out the exception to every rule that we have um, and, and navigating that with us so i'm glad you highlighted that um Aiden, any other reflections or thoughts on our orientation process especially coming into kind of a, a busy unit um, to start with uh yeah i had very similar positive experiences to vanessa and cassie um i think the orientation, uh, as Vanessa um, and Brendan, you have mentioned, is not learning everything. And, and for me, meeting the people that you then say, you know, in, in this event, this is who you contact to learn more, or this is who you contact to touch base, uh, has been probably the most useful part of that orientation that I still then come back to um, now, 11 weeks down the track. Um, so um, for, uh, the, the other thing I will mention is that even uh, having been a med student at St V's, it is very different once you're um, a junior doctor. And I, I do think MD4 and, and the whole of med school prepares you very well. Um, but the, the the orientation experience um, kind of uh, highlights how, how different the experience will be once you're the doctor that, that gets paged or gets asked the questions. So um, I found that really great throughout, uh, not only just those three days, but um, you have fantastic kind of uh, check-ins with your seniors. Um, we've already had, in terms of term one, the you know the halfway and the end of term check-in with a consultant, um, which was um, really really valuable. So uh, I have really found that that's been an ongoing process as well. Thanks, Ed. Um Moving on to the next question, I was hoping to have your reflections on. I, I know we've touched on this kind of on and off through everything you said so far, but. Your reflections on the internship so far. Um, I, I don't want to show you about this, but it can be a very challenging year. I just want to hear kind of your thoughts on some of the highlights and some of the more challenging aspects of it for you uh, so far. Um, I have absolutely loved it. Is is the bottom line. Um, one one kind of reflection that I've had is a lot of uh, non medical, you know, family and friends and um, things like that. I found have said to me oh you know you're a junior doctor now how's that all going and i think they're kind of expecting you to say i'm working horrendous hours and it's horrible and i have to say actually it's, it's fantastic and i'm really enjoying it um so overall it's been great uh you are really well supported um i've 
certainly found um, things like evening and, and weekend shifts more challenging, but not unsupported. And um, in all of the situations where I've needed to, I've had people that I can call on uh, and, and lean on and ask a question. And uh, I've never once had someone unhappy that I've been you know, asking them a question or, or contacted them for advice. Um, so uh, I, I've found it a really great kind of continuation from medical school in, in terms of the learning, but then you're also taking a, a leap of responsibility up, which is really exciting actually. And um, yeah, I've, I've found it a great, uh, well-supported experience so far. Thanks, Amy. We'll be glad to hear it. Um, we have Michael along, along the route. Vanessa, what some of your highlights and some of your challenges from the year thus far? Yeah, so I think um, I definitely agree with Aidan. I think that that leap from um, MT4 to internship in terms of the responsibility can be exciting, but it can also be very frightening. So I think um, it's definitely um, <laughs> normal to feel very overwhelmed in the first few weeks. Um, or just throughout the whole of internship, whatever your vibe is. Um, but um, I think the thing that to remember is that everyone is in the same boat, which is really good, and like to keep your like connections with your other interns and stuff, and and just keep talking about it. But uh, I guess the highlights for me so far, I think it's just like knowing that I, you know, you, you can actually do the job. Like I, I think a lot of the time we just kind of focus on all of the. I don't want to say failures, but just like the things that we're not so successful at and everyone at being medical students and people in medicine, we can all be really hypercritical. But um, when you finish MD4 and you become an intern, like you are an intern and you are doing it and you, you're supported, you're a junior doctor. And um, so I think like that's the things that I, that every day I go home and I'm like, you know, like it's actually okay. Like I haven't dropped out of medicine yet, so it's all good. Um, yeah. Uh, and then in terms of the challenges, I think, um, uh, just like a cusp, just getting used to like working full time again. Like even if you spend all your life in hospital as a medical student, it just takes a little bit of something. Something um, working full time is it can be very draining and exhausting. So I think making sure you have a good uh, work life balance and in your personal time, uh, making sure you um, you know fill up your cup. That isn't that what they say? And you have all of that extra stuff that makes you feel really happy and good and nice um, to balance out some of the more um, challenging and stressful situations you can deal with in, in a clinical setting is really important. So, yeah. We've got a lady. Um, <laughs> hello. Hello. Uh, you may notice we've been joined by Jen. Jen, thank you so much for making time for me this evening. Um, I want to introduce you to the group. What I've done so far is as a bit of an introduction, give a little bit of background about your history, kind of your clinical school and what we kind of background to you, what rotations you're doing across the year, um, and uh, a little bit about your Yeah, I think we're up to me, so I've just rushed off from a consultant board round, it's been very busy. Um, so I'm similar to Vanessa, I was at Deakin, um, I'm from Geelong. Uh, so we're probably not representative of the cohort. The majority of um, interns are probably from Melbourne Uni, but anyway, there's quite a few Deakin students. Um, yeah, so I did science undergrad, I did honours, I did a year of physio. I also rode professionally, rode like in a boat, not on a bike. <laughs> um, as well during all that time. Um, and now I just completed my emergency rotation and I've started my gen surge rotation as well. And for the rest of the year, I'm doing an anaesthetics rotation next, and then I'm doing GP in Swan Hill, and then I'm doing gen med back at St. Great, thank you. Um, we were going around asking about kind of highs and lows across the year. Um, while you're kind of reflecting on that as a, as a question, I might jump to Cassie. Cassie, what have been your highs and lows so far? Yeah, um, I think sort of going off what um, both Aiden and Vanessa said, um, inevitably there's going to be challenges that you sort of confront, particularly in the first part of your intern rotation. Um, I think there's always going to be something new that you have to make a decision on that you haven't experienced before or seen as a med student. Um, and I think whilst that is challenging, ultimately, I think one of the really good things about St Vincent's in particular is that um, there's always somebody to 
approach and ask for help. Um, and that's certainly been my experience so far. So I think anything where you feel that maybe you're feeling a little bit out of your depth and you need some assistance or advice, um, there's always someone to call upon. And I think that that's been really, really valuable. Um, and whether that be sort of a co-intern or a supervisor or somebody that you can call over the phone, um, there's just lots of people to lean on. And I think that's been really, really nice. Um, and I think it's also that feeling that if there was ever something that did go wrong or um, a really difficult situation that you were put in, that there are people that you can turn to as well, um, be that somebody from the medical education team or a supervisor or somebody that you sort of have worked with in the past. I think that there's a lot of people around that are here to help and are looking out for you. Um, I think one of my highlight experiences was on my first week um, of internship. I was on like a surgical rotation and um, somebody from a completely different team, a registrar from one of the um, periop medicine teams happened to be on the wards and noticed that I was a new intern on the wards and just came up to me and said, you know, if there's ever a time that you need to ask a question, um and you're looking for someone for advice like give me a call this is my number just sort of out of nowhere there was nothing wrong at the time so I just thought that was really nice um so that was very comforting to have on your first week on a surge um rotation um I think it was the first time I was on the wards by myself so it was a really really nice thing to have um and I think that that sort of approach to wanting to teach interns and lots of junior medical staff is um, reflected in most units or if not all the units across um, some days. So I think you can feel that was very comforting to me, I think, going into the whole um, start of my rotation and, and to the year ahead as well. Thanks, Cassie. That's lovely. That's such a nice story. Um, <laughs> I, want, I kind of want to know who that person was. Good luck, Blake. Um, Jen, same question to you. Um, what have been some of the highlights and some of the lowlights or challenges of the year so far? Yeah, I think the highlights are just the autonomy you get, um, just coming from a medical student um, into being a doctor. Um, and I went into emergency as my first rotation too. So you're seeing your own patients, you're doing the workup, um, and then you sort of, you know, you're coming up with the management yourself and then you're, you're always checking it with a consultant. And I definitely echo what Cassie said, like it's just so well supported. Um, even the nursing staff are great and there really is that element of flat hierarchy that I know I remember hearing being talked about in the info night last year. Um, you know, everyone's just friendly and it doesn't matter whether you're a nurse, whether you're a PSA, whether you're a med student, um, everyone just sort of holds your, holds your hand and um, I think it just creates a really good learning environment. So that's probably been the overall highlight for me, just having that autonomy, but feeling supported in that as well. Um, low lights, <laughs> not <a> shift. <laughs> um, but like, I don't know, I actually enjoyed it. Like it's cool medicine. You get, you get to um, work in a really tight knit team. Just the low light, because you just get nauseous the whole time, but like you can get through. Um, yeah, it's busy on my surgical rotation, first week in. Um, yeah, probably, probably a bit overwhelming with the amount of jobs to do, but again, you're supported. Like, there's always someone to ask. So, yes, it feels overwhel overwhelming, but you never feel unsupported. Thank you for that. Uh, thanks, Jen. Um, I agree, my chefs. The nausea never goes away, it's like where it's a little tricky. Um, <laughs> uh, just to clarify, because it came up in the questions as well, uh, there's no set night shift rotations. Uh, we got rid of those a, a couple of years ago now. There are rotations with night shifts, a, a component of them. Really, emergency department, I think, is the only one, um, uh, both CVs and externally. Otherwise, um, no night shifts across the other rotations. But I agree, they're a challenge. Um, I want to finally kind of wrap up with, we have a, a captive audience here um, of people coming into their intern year ahead of them. And you've experienced a bit yourselves, what's one piece of advice you might give uh, to those incoming interns? Aidan, uh, I might start with yourself if that's okay. Um, thank you. Um, 
I just have a very quick 10 second anecdote before I do that. I had a very similar experience to Cassie making a phone re um, referral where I, I called uh, Gen Med Reg in my first week and I was very nervous and I made this phone call and I said, I'm hoping you can take this referral about XYZ. And then the person said, firstly, congrats, you almost finished your first week of internship. How's it going? <laughs> so that made me feel a lot more at ease. Um, so that was fantastic. Uh, in terms of advice, um, First, in terms of the applications, I think listen to everything that the hospitals say from a practical perspective. Um, and it's all said for a reason. Things like keeping your CV short, practicing your interviews, uh, particularly with another person, I found extremely useful. Um, and attention to detail on the cover letter, things like addressing it to the correct person. Uh, it's all very boring, but uh, all very relevant. So in terms of your applications, definitely pay attention to detail with that. In terms of the rest of this year, um, my main piece of advice is throw yourself into as, as much as you can. Um, you know, go up and review the patient that needs reviewing, take the history before the, the intern or the resident does, look at the ECG, um, do the practical, you know, the, the bloods or the cannula, uh, because next year um, we, we have mentioned that you'll be supported and you will be, but you're the first person that gets asked to do all of those sorts of things. So if you've done them all before, I think you'll be a lot more comfortable doing them as a junior doctor next year. That's my main piece of advice. Thanks, Ben. Uh, back into the room again. Uh, Cassie, uh, or either of you. Let's stop me. You're being so prescriptive. I'll <laughs> you want to go first. Um, gosh, piece of advice. Um, very, very similar to Aiden. I think enjoy the last year of um, med school, like really throw yourself into it and throw yourself into the rotations. Um, it can be quite a stressful time going into the interview period and the application period. And I think having a healthy balance during that time with your placement requirements and also preparing for all of those um, things is really, really important. And then I think once that's sort of done, yeah, definitely throw yourself into the rotations, really try and think about what's going to help you next year and it's getting as much as hands-on experience as possible because it really will um, ease the transition a lot, I think. Um, and in terms of the actual applications and advice that I was given and really was glad that I was given is just be as authentic as you possibly can with all the application stuff. So your CV, obviously, be authentic and very genuine there, but with your um, cover letter, if you can sort of I mean, I don't mark them, I'm not sure how they're received, but I think if you can put yourself on a piece of paper, get your um, get a bit of who you are across, I think that that's a really valuable thing and hopefully I imagine what um, a place like St Vincent's would really value. Um, so if you can try and do that, um, do your best. Um, and similarly with just interview practising, it's such an uncomfortable thing to practise in front of a camera and it's a really a uh, strange sort of scenario to be in, sit in front of a camera and answer these questions. So if you can sort of rip the band-aid by doing some practice with a colleague or um, even recording yourself and a scenario talking about <laughs> that earlier. And um, it's it's not always fun to watch yourself back, but it is really good practice and you do get a few tips just watching your own recording. Um, so that would probably be my advice in terms of that stuff, yeah. Yeah, just um, stepping off what Cassie said about the applications, you know, there is no magic formula to like what is going to be a successful application. And I think at the end of the day, you just have to put you into that application. Like that's what people want to see. I know in the past, like things have been quite heavily focused on like, um, you know, marks and stuff, um, but that's that's not a thing anymore. And um, at the end of the day, you want to make sure that, you um, the hospital or whoever it is that's reading what you've written about yourself and then has that short snippet of those like what is it like five or six minutes of interview actually like can see who you are and like gets that across so um i can't stress enough and i kind of agree with you more about being genuine on the application just be yourself like include the things that you love and why you're passionate about as of medicine and and um and then at the end of the day like an internship's an internship regardless so um you'll have a, a good uh and stress for time. Um, <laughs> and uh, in terms of my other advice, I think the two things I would say is make sure that you have a brains trust, as in like just a group of 
people that you're friends with that are, you know, God knows where they are, you might not see them anymore because you're all going to just different hospitals in different state, different parts of the state, different parts of the country or whatever. But just like somewhere where you can like put the silly thing that you did that day or like ask the question that you are like, did I do the right thing? Or just like share really like, you know, emotional things that happened, like just something like that. Make sure you you have like a kind of community. Um, and then also just, if you haven't already, like have some kind of thing outside of medicine that you actually enjoy doing at an outlet, because um, that's really, really important. Uh, I think I'll just... Yeah. Sorry, Jim. I think a lot of it's been covered. Yeah, a lot of it's been covered, so I won't stress the point. Proper preparation prevents poor performance. Um, <laughs> but I think my, I was reflecting on it actually, my top tip is to, don't stop being interested in medicine. Like, don't let all this, you know, application stuff, the stress of internship um, cloud what you actually enjoy and what you're interested in. Because if you're interested in it, you, you'll you ask questions, you'll understand the patient more, and that will make everything easier as well. If you understand the pathology, if you understand how the patient's feeling, all your jobs will end up being easier as well. And that's probably more of an internship um skill I guess but as a med student that it starts when you're a med student I think so continue continue to ask questions and especially while you have that freedom so that thank you so much Jen. and thank you so much to you all for giving your time and experience and insights um I am very appreciative that you were able to give uh genuine accounts of your time so far and I hope the people online um I got something from that too. Um, we might keep you here if you can. I understand you may have other things to get to. Um, we're going to transition now to our Q&A portion of the evening. I know questions have been flooding through. Um, I'd like to take this opportunity to uh, properly introduce another member of our team. Um, Linda Healy is our medical education coordinator, has been listening avidly online and moderating the, the conversation. Um, Linda, do you want to say hello? Hello, everybody. Uh, it's great to be with you this evening. Um, thank you to everybody who has uh, already entered questions into the chat. Um, I guess in the interest of not um, keeping our intern panel here any longer than necessary, I might just refer to the questions that has been specifically targeted to you guys, and then we might move on to some more generalised questions about the logistics of applying. So. Um, there's a question that's come through that says, uh, how easy did it feel time-wise to maintain your hobbies and activities outside of the hospital? Um, so it really is rotation dependent. So during my emergency rotation, have you guys done your, you've just started. During emergency, really easy because the shifts are a little bit, um, you do really work that 38 hour week. Um, but now that I've been into my surgical rotation, it is a different story. Um, and so I'm still trying to find that balance. Like I really can't go a day without exercising. So um, that's been my challenge just this coming week and the first week into the new rotation. Um, but I think you you work it out as you go and it's, and it's, it's possible. Um, you've just got to have all those good support networks in place. I can say it's definitely a, a struggle, um, especially when you're on rotations that like don't have set, like I said, you've got a set roster, but uh, sometimes, you know, there's unrostered overtime and, and that's just part of the, you know, part of the job. Um, but I think like just taking the small wins where you can. So like if you can't get out for a run, but you can ride to work or something, then that's like a really good achievement. Or if you just do one of your hobbies rather than the four you were doing in medical school, then that's an achievement. So um, it's challenging, but like Jen said, you just figure it out as you go. I probably don't have too much to add. Um, I mean, Aiden and I are probably both similar, um, similar to Jen. I'm not sure about you, Vanessa, like all pretty um, keen, keen on exercise. <laughs> Aiden and I are both runners. Um, I think starting on a surge rotation, there were periods of time where the workload was more and the hours were slightly longer, but ultimately it sort of ebbs and flows. And I think having some flexibility there 
Um, that being said, I think trying your best to sort of maintain links to things that you really care about. For me, that's like an athletics club that I, if I can't be at a session, I'll sort of keep in contact with everyone that's there um, and sort of work out doing things around um, around the times of when I'm working. But I think ultimately having a busy rotation is for a period of time. And I think I've now jumped into the ED, ED rotation and I'm absolutely loving the time that comes with it. And it is really, really nice. <laughs> um, and I think that it's just sort of one of those things like, yes, there'll be busy periods of times, but I think that'll just sort of come with the career of going into medicine and ultimately you sort of go with the ebbs and flows um, that comes with that and ultimately find your own balance. But there's definitely balance to be found, I think, almost no matter what rotation you end up on. And there's a lot of safety netting for interns and doctors to work safe hours. So it's not something that's unachievable. Um, and I think if you're ever concerned about there being a high workload that you're not um, feeling like you're able to sort of balance that, then that's something that you can go to your supervisor or anyone on the medical education team. That's something that they really like to hear feedback on. And it sort of goes back to that whole if there is um, if there are issues that you encounter as an intern, there's such a great um, sort of room or wealth of people that you can talk to about that sort of thing to address those problems. So um, yeah, ultimately good balance, I'd say. I'm not sure if you agree to anything. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, I echo that it's uh, yeah the the sentiments that everyone has mentioned, particularly that it's rotation dependent. Um, the one thing that I want to add is just about, uh, or, or speaking from a practical uh, personal perspective about what you heard earlier from medical workforce, um, they have been fantastic. Uh, any overtime that myself or any of my colleagues have done ha has been absolutely approved and paid and, and that's been no problem at all. Um, my first rotation um the in the, the previous year the interns were logging overtime for the half an hour early you know the the ward round prep and then this year they just changed and, and automatically included that in our timetable so they are really happy uh, medical workforce to hear feedback and say how can we be structuring your timetable better and that's been absolutely fantastic i've, I've found it really really well supported and i haven't found um I think the phrase earlier was that, you know, if you do do overtime, you'll be well supported and certainly um, paid for that, but we don't want you to. And I found that to be the case. Your, your registrars and consultants are extremely good at saying, you know, that, you know, hand over and go home, um, you know, work, work the, those safe hours. So I found it really fantastic. Thank you very much, intern panel. Really um, excellent answers there. Um, mm. Thanks for sharing uh, your experiences. Um, we might move on to um, some of the other questions and I'll, I'm going to try in the interest of time to perhaps group some of the questions together by theme and we'll try and give you um, thorough answers but in a time efficient manner just because we have quite a lot to get through. Erin, um, I might ask you to respond to this question. We've got questions around um, how many intern positions will we have available in 2024? And um, what is our general intake from the spectrum of clinical schools, please? Thanks, Melinda. Um, so in answer to your question about how many intern positions we'll have next year, that is 65 um, positions. And in answer to your question about the clinical schools, St Vincent's clinical school students that we employ as interns, it generally sits around the 20 to 30 percent mark um, of yeah, our 65 intern positions. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Um, Brendan, I might ask you to respond to this one if that's OK. There's lots of questions regarding um, priority group two positions or priority group three availability, um, wanting to know uh, potentially how many positions do we have for those that might be in a CAT 2 or CAT 3 position? Um, so it's an, an interesting perennial question. Thanks, Melinda. Um, we have no control over the Category 2 or Category 3 uh, allocations. That's held centrally by PMCV. Um, so we go through our uh, category one match process 
and we make our kind of um, our our rankings. It's only after we submit all that to, to um, BMCV and we wait to hear back from them, and they really kind of drive the process of how many category two or three um, uh, uh, places or interns we can have after that. So we're with very limited control over that. What I will say is kind of historically, I would say Melinda, you may be able to correct me, even at uh, two to three per year in, in the category two um, um, level. And category three is very variable um, because it kind of depends on, on, on the late positions and late changes in the process that has, has, come to, has happened up to that point. Um, I think that, that's, you know, uh, that's as accurate as I can get for that historical precedent over the last couple of years, uh, two or three within the category two um, realm. Thanks very much, Brendan. Um, I can see that there's been a uh, quite a few questions regarding mm. cover letter. Um, you will notice that I've also put a link in the chat to information specific to what should be included in the cover letter. Um, so please refer to that link. Um, one question that's come up quite common is uh, who do you address that to, that cover letter to? Um, and uh, somebody has very kindly uh, responded within the chat from the information on the internet uh, website, and that is correct. It's Dr. Neil Cunningham, who has a clinical director of medical workforce. Um, that is the appropriate person to be addressing the cover letter to. Um, Questions about what are we looking for in cover letters? I think the interns very nicely spoke to this in that we really want to get an impression of who you are as a person, not just as a um, student or an academic, but how do you actually fit um, in with the ethos and I guess the organisational culture and values that we have at St. Bees? What have you got to offer in that regard? And um, how do you see yourself fitting in and um, adding value to our organisation. That's um, some really good things that we can give you some tips on to, to talk about in your cover letter. Um, be, be genuine and give us an impression of who you are as a well-rounded person is, is a good piece of advice. Around one page or roughly 400 words is um, a, a guide as to what um, how, how uh, lengthy your cover letter should be. Um, I might move on to some other questions with regards to the logistics of the application process. There's some questions around um, interviews. Um, either Erin either or Brendan, I'm not sure who, whoever would like to respond to this. Um, questions around, uh, will there be a separate uh, interview process in addition to the pre-recorded video interviews that PMCV um, create? and also, I guess closely related to that is what's actually going to be reviewed as part of the recruitment process, what's involved, what elements are we looking at, and um, what weighting would we be giving to those is a common theme, if you wouldn't mind responding. Um, so uh, thanks for those good questions. The first bit I think was about uh, live interviews. Uh, we won't be running live interviews. I suppose when PMC switched to this video interview process, we were uncertain, like everyone, as to the robustness of the process, what it would look like, how it would play out. And so we, we um, tried to develop some, some safety netting around that and, and kept open the possibility of, of uh, a second round of interviews, um, not knowing what kind of numbers we'd be getting through. Anyway, with a couple of years' experience with the video interview process and what that looks like and how it plays out, we're far more comfortable uh, that it's a fair, robust process. So we have no plans for any further secondary interviews. So you can take that off your stress list if it's giving you stress. Um, as far as the weighting of each component of our um, process, that's um, not, not unsurprising as the, the, in the video interview, your CD and cover, cover letter holds high weighting for us or hold <laughs> high interest for us. Because I think as our intern panel has, has highlighted already, um, they do give us a sense of you as individuals and a sense of how you, um, um, what your priorities are and what your, your goals are. Um, other components that we would weight far less highly um, would be the uh, references. I know there was a question in the chat about are you allowed to give registrar references? Absolutely. Do they get less than, than consultant references? No, they don't. 
I'm, I'm entirely empathetic to the to the situation you find yourselves in, where the rotations that you're on and the people that you're around kind of dictate what your reference will be and who it will come from. I think the heterogeneity that that introduces to the reference system as it currently stands, um, it doesn't allow you to give the best version of yourself through those references. We appreciate that, we acknowledge it, and so we don't want to uh, put undue pressure by, by assuming that you need to get Professor X from, I mean, Professor somebody, not the guy from the X-Men, um, Professor whoever from the, 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 the head of the unit uh, to give you a glowing reference. I just don't think that's uh, a fair uh, goal to set. Um, so hopefully that, that spells out a little bit about the um, what we value and, and where, where we're waiting. Don't think so. Has that was that all the questions, Val? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. So I guess um, a flow-on question, which is uh, probably um, mm -hmm. makes sense to um, refer to now, is uh, somebody's asking around the nature of the sorts of questions that are posed in those pre-recorded interviews. Are they uh, clinical or case-based, or um, asking are they what they refer to as standard questions? Are we able to give any details on that front? I would almost guarantee that you guys have better access to examples or mock examples of the questions than, than we do. Uh, what I would reassure you is in that there is no off the wall um, approaches to, to the questions. They are testing you in kind of common clinical scenarios and reflecting in how you practice in, in, in uh, you know, interdisciplinary communication or a patient deterioration in the ward. Those type of very common scenarios that I'm sure you would have, have seen come up in the past are the type of questions that come up in the in the interview set. Um, and reflecting on how you would approach them and what you were expected, what is expected of you as an intern in those situations, um, I think gives, gives you the uh, best opportunity to ask them with the best foot forward. Hopefully that helps. Thanks very much. Um, I'm just checking if we still got Catherine on line. Doesn't look like we do. She was jumping off, Belinda. Yep. Okay, that's fine. Jenny, in in Catherine's in in lieu of Catherine being online, Jenny Newnham, I might um, uh, pose these questions to you if that's okay. There's a couple of questions around how are the rotations allocated, um, and I guess. Uh, perhaps slightly aligned with work workforce as well, is will we be offering one or two year contracts? Can I um, hand that one to you, Jenny? Oh, sure. Uh, so for internship, um, the master roster is constructed uh, in such a way that uh, we make sure that every intern will meet the, the requirements uh, to get their APRA registration. Um, I can see from the questions that that everyone's acutely aware that that those requirements will be uh, different next year from what they've been for a long time. So um, we have a requirement to meet um, clinical experiences rather than core terms. Um, so the master roster will be designed to make sure that every intern meets those requirements uh, and then sent out as a template. Uh, and all of our successful applicants will have the opportunity to rank um, each line of the roster um, in in their preferred order um, and things that people would take into account is whether there are particular times that they would want leave whether there are particular um, external um, secondment jobs that they do or do not want to go to um, and obviously uh, particular jobs that that are based at St Vincent's that they want uh, and once we have everyone's preferences back uh, then there's a process of trying to allocate the rotations um, uh, and we try very hard or work first try very hard to make sure that um, everyone gets somewhere within their first four preferences uh, every now and then we have a year where there's one or two sort of lines or, you know, master rosters for the year that are very popular, in, in which case um, people might not get uh, their top four. But people, we usually go pretty close. Great. Thank you, Jenny. And the one and two year contracts, is that something you're able to speak to? 
Yeah, so so historically, intern contracts have just been one year. Uh, it makes sense having a uh, a two year framework that that's going to start next year that we would offer two year contracts. Um, so that is something that we intend to do. Um, the uh, the what um, second year looks like in 2025 um, is uh, a little bit yet to be determined because, um, and I, I see there is another question about that. At the moment, there's there's a lot of uh, a lot of streaming that happens uh, in the second postgraduate year where people may have a very strong interest towards critical care or physician training or surgery and and uh, really stream to. Um, a year that is entirely surgical or entirely critical care, that will have to change with the new framework. Um, uh, the um, allocation of two-year contracts um, obviously won't necessarily guarantee people that they would have, they would be able to have a position within the stream of interest in their second year working with us. Um, uh, but um, if they find something that they prefer elsewhere, then it would not be a problem for them to break contract if we're not able to offer them the position that they would like in their uh, second year of working. I hope that made sense. Thank you very much, Jenny. Um, just adding, I guess, uh, going back to the discussion around the rotations and options there, there's been a few specifics um, asked about how many positions for certain rotations. So to clarify, we send uh, two interns per term to the Royal Children's, for those of you who are expressing interest in paediatrics. So overall, 10 opportunities across the course of the year uh, for interns to be involved in that rotation. Uh, question around radiology, we have one intern uh, per term in radiology. So there's five options for that. Uh, similarly for anaesthetics, one uh, intern per rotation. So I hope that helps um, give some more specifics on that front. Um, I think it also, by uh, what we've been discussing, it kind of confirms one of the related questions. Will there be uh, specialty streaming uh, in uh, HMO2 year? Yes, there will continue to be um, various streams, be that general, medical, uh, surgical or crit care. Um, I think we've also touched on annual leave that Jenny said that you are able to actually put in your preferences for annual leave. Um, of course, if you don't have a specific preference, that's okay too. Um, and of course, any sort of information that the medical workforce uh, can mm -hmm. receive that would help them in making those decisions would be very welcome, I'm sure. Um, so yes, if there are important events like weddings or things like that, then um, please uh, pop those details in when you make your application uh, to workforce for annual leave. Um, I think there's a question around psychiatry and the mandatory psychiatry rotation. Jenny, would I be able to go back to you to mention there's a question, would the psychiatry rotation, with it being mandatory in the new framework, would that be guaranteed to be in the internship PGY1 year or would it be something that would also be possibility in PGY2 year? Uh, so um, the mandatory psychiatry rotations is separate from the framework. Um, the 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 new two year pre vocational framework doesn't mandate psychiatry rotations at all. Um, but um, as part of mental health reform Victoria, there was an intention uh, to um, make it mandatory for all junior doctors to work a psychiatry rotation within their first or second year working, um, for a variety of reasons that um, mandate has has been softened to um, a statement that it would be desirable, but it's not It's not currently mandatory. Um, that said, we do have quite a lot of psychiatry positions in internship and in second year, um, which would include uh, acute inpatient psychiatry, uh, drug and alcohol, consultation liaison psychiatry, CAT team, which works out of the emergency and also in community, um, psycho-oncology, uh, and community psychiatry, as well as aged psychiatry. So, so we have a variety of positions available in internship and in second year. Um, it's currently not mandatory and it won't be mandatory next year. Thanks, Jenny. Um, I might go to um, Erin and Brendan again. I don't mind who responds or you might have a combined response. Uh, questions around rostering. I think we've we've 
touched on it um, once, but could we just reiterate again uh, the options or the involvement of night shifts for interns and also somebody specifically asking uh, an idea of what would the longest hours per day or week be um, likely for an intern and are there any seven on seven off rotation arrangements? Thanks, Belinda. Um, okay, so the first question about night shift, I can answer that you'll only be rostered on night shift in your emergency rotation. Uh, night shift's been removed from all other rotations uh, in the last few years. So just emergency, you will have some nights in there, not the remainder of your internship. Um, I forgot my second question in the middle, but I know there was a question about the seven days on, seven days off, which Brendan will be a better place to answer than myself. So I think the middle question was on a maximum hours per week as well. Um, and so we work off a baseline of a 38 hour week uh, for contracted work. But like I would say every other health service within certain rotations are rostered and unrostered overtime. And so rostered overtime is built within the, the program. We recognize that there are times inevitably as part of the clinical week that there's a requirement to be there. Um, and so I think our maximum rostered overtime is um, in, in a, a couple of hours across the week, perhaps to, within the under the 40 hour mark from my understanding for rostered hour across our rotations. Unrostered overtime is, is the unexpected that comes up and both tasks that come up um, on, on all patients, etc. That is an, an additional component that is measured, looked at, and tried to address through our modeling and staffing. Um, we have a fatigue management policy within the hospital that our director of our clinical director of medical workforce has created. If we look at kind of safe, safe working hours up to kind of 48 hours of, of overtime built in as part of a, 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 a um, rostered program um, still sits with, with within kind of safe practice, getting up towards kind of a 58 hour per week, kind of having 10 onto it again, um, is an unsafe practice and not a sustainable practice. And, and that's where we'd be intervening to avoid that from occurring. There's going to be outlier events where, where something happens where you're going to have uh, uh, busy perhaps across the year, but those as measures like a 38 hour week up to 48 hour a week in, 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 in overtime is what we would expect. And then there may be outliers to that, but that's where very much it's on, on us to control to reduce um, and ensure it doesn't occur. As far as seven days off, seven days on goes um, for at St. Vincent's Hospital ourselves, um, we used to have those rotations for night shifts when they were a term. Um, they no longer exist a, as a term, and the science behind seven days on, seven days off points towards it being a, a, a not a great idea um, and leading to kind of patient risks and staff risks. So we've moved away from it, and I don't believe there are any seven days off on um, seven days off rotations um, currently in, in internship. Um, for some of our sister hospitals, um, I am unsure, and I, I believe the Warrnambool Emergency Department or Warrnambool Rotations previously did a model of seven days on, seven days off, but they've now moved away from. Um, people were keen to kind of get back to Melbourne for, for a week, um, but they recognise the kind of patient safety issues around that and moved away from it. Hopefully that answers the question. Thanks very much, Brendan. Um, while we're still on sort of the topic of, of rostering and rotations, um, Jenny, I might um, pose this one to you. Um, questions around, is it compulsory for all interns to go on a rural secondment during their year? Um, and also, uh, if there are special circumstances surrounding family that might make that a little more difficult, um, is it, is, are those taken into consideration when um, allocating um, placements to secondment hospitals? Yeah, sure. Um, so, no, it's not compulsory uh, for interns to go to a rural secondment site. We do have a number of uh, seconded rotations, um, uh, but uh, if, if we think about our master roster and the lines on the roster, not all of the, of the allocations 
would include a, a rural or regional secondment site. Uh, so I guess if that's something that you can't do for family reasons or other reasons, uh, you would preference uh, the options that don't have those rural jobs in them more highly. Uh, and there's an opportunity when you're giving preferences to give some um, uh, substantiating information or extra information if you want to, to support your case. And, you know, so if you've got uh, carer duties in Melbourne or other things, then that's a very valid reason uh, for you maybe needing to stay closer to home than others. Thank you very much, Jenny. Um, bit of a change of chat in discussion, but a really common theme that's come up quite a few times through the chat. Um, Jenny, I might pose this one to you. Um, what is St Vincent's position on abortion, voluntary assisted dying and also contraception? Um, what, what is, what is uh, the organisational perspective on those topics? Yeah, that's a common question and it's probably a fair question. So it's, a, um, I, I guess, a, by name, a Catholic hospital, um, you know, founded by the Sisters of Charity. But um, I don't know the proportion. I, I would probably suspect that most of us work within the hospital aren't necessarily Catholic. Uh, there's certainly a, a, uh, a sense um, of uh, the mission, uh, which is more about care of the poor and vulnerable um, and compassionate care. Um, but really, um, there isn't restriction on necessary uh, clinical care. So, but in terms of those specific things, there are some differences in the way we would word things and discuss things. So, I work um, clinically within oncology. Uh, so, obviously, all of those issues would come up. You know, people having chemotherapy, we need to talk about uh, contraception, we need to talk about. Um, childbearing we need to talk about death and you know sometimes patients are interested in in voluntary assisted dying uh, so um, uh, we are able to um, provide direction for people we can refer them to the appropriate services but um, at the, in the current environment uh, St Vincent's employed staff um, are not able to prescribe um, contraceptive medications, uh, abortions aren't performed uh, at St Vincent's Hospital um, and um, voluntary assisted dying uh, permits or prescriptions aren't administered at St Vincent's Hospital. There is a, a really active palliative care unit. Um, they have a consultative service who can talk to patients about a voluntary assisted dying that comes up. And if patients have... Um, gone through the process of voluntary assisted dying and have their own medication, they are able to bring it into hospital as they usually would uh, and um, they're not uh, prevented from having that with them or from using it if that's what they choose to do. Thanks very much, Jenny. Um, again, changing the, the flow of conversation a little bit, I might pose this question to Erin. Um, there's a few people who are expressing interest for opportunities to be involved in delivery of education and teaching um, to either MD, MD4s or to other um, peers. Um, do, we, do we provide opportunities for people to get involved in some peer-to-peer um, -peer teaching and, and education events? Yeah, fantastic. Thanks, Val. Um, so I will start by saying that we have a JMS Education Committee, which I know Brandon mentioned earlier. Uh, so as an intern, you can sit on that committee and have a say uh, on what's taught in our pre-vocational education program and our intern education program as well. Uh, there is a subcommittee that's formed within that JMS education committee with the interns. So a handful of interns do get a direct say uh, to the intern education calendar for the year. Uh, in regards to getting involved with uh, new peer or medical student teaching, absolutely. Um, one of our docs in particular has set up a medical student education program uh, that a lot of our junior medical staff teach into. Uh, she's handing over the reins shortly to somebody else, but that program will continue on and we have really good engagement uh, with our junior medical staff teaching near peer, but specifically to the medical students at the cohort. Thanks, Erin. Um, probably our most popular or one of our most popular themes mm. and questions that has come on um, come up in the chat has been how will St Vincent's um, plan to use the filtering function that PMCB has? 
Um, so Brendan, um, is it okay if you give us a little rundown on how we plan to use it and will we be using it and what, what might be, we be using it to, to filter to? Thanks, Belinda. Yeah, great question. Um, from you know, uh, a popular one as well, I see. Um, we will be using the filtering fun function. We, as a kind of matter of principle from our uh, recruitment process, are really keen to work with people who want to work with us. Um, and so, as, as part of that, we want to um, um, show enthusiasm for those who are enthusiastically seeking it and convince them to work uh, in. Um, so we're all, uh, in keeping with previous years, we're filtering to the top three um, of, of the rankings for St. Vincent's. PMCG obviously is, allows to rank um, up to uh, whatever it is, it's, it's, it's eight, uh, I think, from memory. Um, but we'll be um, looking at the top three. PMCG have useful educational uh, webinars on this from previous years and the ones we're putting out this year. Um, I think what the advice I'd give to, to candidates is to uh, preference it where you want to work um, and gaming the, the, the preferences is a challenge and it generally not going to work in your favour. Um, it leads to kind of, you can control the process after that, but what I do is to have an honest approach to, to where you want to work for and, and, and preference as such. And, and allow the, the process to play out. Um, I think there was only one part of that question, so hopefully I've answered it. Thanks, Brendan. Um, probably one of the most important questions of the evening. Um, what are the social events and the cafes that are around the place? Um, I can answer this. Uh, yes, the RMO Society at St. V's is very active. Um, they have some uh, excellent um, education events which are quite social uh, as well as being um, helpful in terms of professional development. They have a pub of the month um, event which is quite popular. Uh, so I definitely would um, encourage you to get involved with that. A uh, great way to get to know some new colleagues. Um, yes, cafes, I think we are absolutely spoiled for choice. Gertrude Street is literally less than a hundred metre walk from the back door of emergency department. So you can definitely get lots of um, post-night duty brunch or lots of uh, mid-morning cafe caffeine pick-me-ups. Um, on top of that, we actually have some cafes on site as well that are actually part of the St. Dee's campus, which are all very good as well. But um, being in Fitzroy, there's lots and lots of options there. Um, I think probably one of the last themes or questions, um, and Jenny, I might, pop back to you if you would be able to um, answer these. Uh, would you be able to give a bit of an idea of explaining um, how one might go about uh, pursuing sort of an ONG interest or what pathway might be open to people who um, want to come to St. V's but are interested in pursuing some ONG? Uh, yeah, sure. So, um... We don't have specific ONG exposure in the internship. Um, we have a few jobs in our general stream uh, from um, second year um, that um, are obstetrics and gynaecology jobs. So at Werribee, I think we send three um, staff, so three second years to Werribee each rotation. Um, some people choose to go and do that job for six months and complete the DIPOPs in that time. Um, there's also, we also have an, an ONG rotation in Swan Hill. Uh, so um, there are opportunities for obstetrics and gynaecology through our general stream uh, from second year. Um, and I, I know they're of interest um, or can be of interest to people who want to do obstetrics, but also to people who have an interest in, in general practice training and uh, a broad clinical skill set. That was actually the second part of the question I was going to come to you about too, Jenny. Is um, there any advice or um, help in terms of uh, how one might pursue a general uh, practice training pathway if they're interested to come through St B's? So, so we've spent, uh, well, there's been a bit of effort put in in recent years to try and strengthen the general practice um, offerings that we have. Um, 
Uh, so we do have a general stream, which is primarily designed so from um, second year onwards for people who have an interest in either psychiatry uh, or general practice, perhaps obstetrics, gynaecology and maybe dermatology. Uh, but in that stream, there's a fairly broad range of uh, rotations that provide the kind of experiences that people would need for general practice, um, which includes... Um, some paediatrics exposure. I, I think I did see questions about peds jobs. So there's not specific um, paediatric jobs at the children's from um, after internship, um, but uh, jobs, warnable emergency department sees quite a lot of paediatric cases uh, and that is uh, accepted by the College of GPs as being paediatric exposure for people interested in doing general practice. Um, a variety of psychiatry jobs, as I mentioned earlier, which are all very useful for general practice. Um, as well as general medicine, uh, emergency, um, and a few other things that I can't remember are in the um, general stream. Thank you, Jenny. Um, and Brendan's beaten me to the punch. I was going to come to him about EMR right now, but he's already written a response. Is there anything you want to add to your written response in the chat about EMR at St. V's? Um, no, hopefully that covers off and I suppose a, a, a blunt short answer is that for the 2024 clinical year, there won't be an EMR in place in St. Vincent's. Um, we are um, currently have are actively engaged with, with the, on the federal level for our co-funding model um, for a, an EMR rollout. That, uh, given the time of events, that what needs to craft that 2024 is not going to be, uh, we won't have EMR in place. That being said, as I've mentioned, um, there are um, uh, it isn't totally paper based. There are online um, or uh, digital recording uh, for notes in, in general medicine, ICU, uh, other areas um, across the hospital. Um, and we, we look forward to the day for, uh, that we have EMR um, across all units and all uh, disciplines within the hospital, hopefully in the near future. Perfect. Thanks, Brendan. Um, I believe uh, that that basically. Uh, wraps up the vast majority of questions that people have posed. Um, obviously, we've still got a couple of minutes still available. So if you have any last minute burning questions, um, I encourage you to please pop them in the chat now so that we can hopefully address them for you um, before the end of the session. While people are thinking about any last minute questions, I might just use this opportunity to talk to um, the opportunity to have a hospital tour. Um, some of you may have already seen on our internet page, there are details around um, the option to come and have a look around uh, our campus. And that is a guided tour by an existing intern that currently is working here at St. V's. So you get uh, a complete um, unfiltered experience to be able to ask questions and see exactly what it's like. Um, to, to have a look around campus, but also to hear firsthand from uh, one of our interns. Um, so I will pop the link to that in the chat, but the link is also um, on our internet uh, page. And a couple of you have already inquired that that hasn't been able to um, link through this morning and that's been a deliberate decision. We haven't made that live until this session finishes this evening. So um, from around 7.30 this evening, that link will be able to uh, accommodate bookings. And it's, it's a case of first in um, best dressed. We would love to be able to offer it to everybody, but we are a little bit uh, limited in terms of resources. So if you're interested, please get in early and book those um, tours. Mm. And they start from uh, tomorrow and will run um, prior to Easter and then recommence again after Easter. Um, so there's lots of uh, dates that you can choose from. Um, thank you for Erin. Erin's put the link in, that's fabulous. Um, there's a couple of extra questions that have come through um, about, oh, Jenny, maybe you're the best person to answer this question. Do you have an idea of what the current BPT pass rate is at St. Vincent's? Uh, I couldn't give you a statistic. Um, it's uh, traditionally always been pretty high. Um, so I guess the number of people going through the BPT um, exam at St Vincent's has, has risen uh, consistently. Um, 
So uh, sit somewhere between 30 and 35 each year on average. I guess a couple of years we might have had 37 people uh, and usually um, might be two or three who don't get through on their first try, um, but um, the majority do. Um, but I couldn't give you a statistic. No worries. Um, a couple of people just raising again a question which we did touch on at the very beginning, but um, just reiterating again, uh, wanting to know sort of the distribution of um, what clinical schools we may have drawn previous cohorts of interns from. Uh, in general, around 20 to 30%, it varies a little bit, um, are from University of Melbourne, and then the remaining are a, a fairly even distribution between um, Deakin and Notre Dame and um, Monash. So um, that hopefully gives you a bit of an idea um, of where we've kind of drawn our cohorts from previously. Well, can I just add to that as well, please, that we don't allocate certain spots for particular universities or allocate the number of places for our clinical school students. It's um, based on merit. Or Absolutely. Yeah. Yes, correct. Um, is there theatre time for interns? Brendan, would you like to answer this one? Um, actually, there is. Um, as part of every hospital um, uh, to create an intern program, uh, regular um, theatre time is part of what BMCD accredited us for uh, when they come and, and look at whether we are worthy of, of, of hosting interns uh, for the clinical year. Um, so the, the, the short, quick answer is yes. Uh, the longer answer is people's um, interest in surgery is, is uh, variable, and that might be the particular stream for you. And uh, business on rotations varies the kind of uh, ability to access depending on, on the weekly workload within each surgery rotation. Part of every feedback session I run um, across every term in, um, in every clinical year for the surgical interns is did you get access to theatre um, and were you encouraged to do so to ensure that any time that, uh, that there is a, a dearth of access to theatre that it can be um, addressed and escalated the unit so we can figure out what went on and, and how we can improve that. Hopefully that answers that question. Thanks very much, Brendan. Uh, will there be an opportunity for dermatology rotations in PGY1 slash 2? Uh, in one, as an intern, uh, unfortunately not. That's not one of the uh, rotations on offer in your first year. But um, as I think Jenny touched on slightly earlier, uh, dermatology is a potential rotation from HMO2 if you are mm. part of our general stream. Um, another question. Most unis are providing PGO type grades without marks. What academic criteria are you considering in selecting interns? Um, Brendan, would you like to talk about how academics might come into our selection process or not? So as part of a subset within a CEV review, we may um, look at that, but we're entirely aware that since the Z score has been removed, that there is, we're comparing apples and oranges across those. And so we don't, um, um, uh, highly weighted at all by any means uh, the, the individual marks uh, because we genuinely don't know how to interpret them when you shift from university to university or clinical school to clinical school. I don't know um, how to compare those two um, very different scenarios. Um, so we appreciate that the universities have moved uh, away from the Z score and we're, we're leaning into that with them um, and don't put um, heavy weighting on individual um, academic scores within each unit or within the university because I don't believe it's fair or transferable between universities. Which was kind of the point of why Z scores were brought in the first place. That's a conversation for another day. Thank you very much. Um, I think this uh, basically concludes our question and answer portion of the evening. Um, of course, there's still a couple of minutes, so if there's any any last questions, we will uh, seek to respond to those. We'll take those questions on notice, and we'll seek to respond to any remaining questions that might come through um, mm. as as we see them, and we'll respond to them in the chat. Um, thank you for those who are saying that the session has been helpful. We appreciate your feedback, um, and I might hand back to Erin and Brendan uh, to to wrap up.
we, we just want to say thanks to um, everyone as well for joining on and engaging us in conversation like this. Um, I want to really thank um, all of the everyone who's put time and effort into putting uh, this on for you, especially our interns. I think the Q&A, mm -hmm. I really appreciate um, that the, uh, they give uh, their time and expertise and insight into what they do. I think they're a shining example of, of the interns we've seen tonight, uh, a shining example of, of, of the type of doctors um, we want and that I would strive to be. Um, this is the final note. I just want to wish you all the very best of luck with your applications and the process. It's a, it's a, uh, like Cassie was saying, it's a kind of scary, challenging, exciting time. Um, it'll all be okay. Um, there's people there to support you. There is a safety net and uh, all the best in the future. This recording uh, of this will be posted um, online in the coming days. So if people um, want to hear more of my Irish ramblings and mumblings and try to make sense of what I was saying, I have the opportunity to do so in a non-live non fashion um, via the recording. Uh, thank you, Belinda, for, for moderating the, the uh, questions. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you to the rest of the team for meeting this too. Thanks, everyone, and good night.